This sermon was recorded at the Church of Christ, Northwest Arkansas. We are Christians seeking to worship God in spirit and in truth, according to the New Testament. Come worship with us Sunday mornings at 1030 at 1708 Elm Springs Road in Springdale, Arkansas. I'd like to join the other brethren in welcoming everybody here this morning. I appreciate that you made it so we could worship God together. Uh, thank you for the participation in the song service. The singing has been great. It's definitely edifying for me and, and helped build me up, so I appreciate that. I also appreciate the prayers on my behalf, and it's my prayer that the things that we study this morning will be in strict accordance to God's Word, uh, and that they'll be useful to you, that they'll be beneficial, and something that you can learn as we continue our Christian walk together. If you remember last time I spoke a few weeks ago, we talked about the Lord's Church, and we talked about just different characteristics of the church. We talked about uh, the name, the structure, both universally and the structure for a congregation. We talked about authority and where that authority comes from and different principles that we're supposed to follow um, as the church and uh, as disciples of Christ. And I want to continue that thought this morning. Um, we're specifically going to be talking about as the church, how are we called to worship God? And I want to be very clear, we're only talking about how to worship in the assembly. So we're going to talk about just some different uh, things that, that we're supposed to practice coming from the scriptures. Um, and I'm only referring to when we assemble together. So this is not uh, all, all the time. So we're going to look at some different things of how we're supposed to worship. When we look all the way back through to the very beginning of time, uh, we can see humans worshiping God, and rightfully so. We can see humans as the creation, worshiping God, the creator, and how, uh, how God intends for us to worship Him a, as our true Creator. So this morning we're going to look at some examples from both the Old Testament and the New Testament uh, of how God expects us to worship Him, and as Christians today, how we're called to worship Him, and, and so that we can know that it is both pleasing to God and it's how He called us to worship. So the first thing I want to look at is what is true worship? Well, when you look over in the book of John chapter 4, Verse 23 and 24, this is Jesus talking here. And Jesus says, But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the, fear, the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. So we can see that Jesus is telling us that the true worshipers, if we want our worship to be true, and we want it to be acceptable to God, it has to consist of two different components. And it has to be with the Spirit, and it has to be in truth. So let's look at those couple things. What is in spirit means? Well, in layman's terms, it really just means with your whole heart. You have to worship God, and you have to truly be into it with your heart. If you look over in Mark chapter 12, verse 30, this is Jesus talking again. And Jesus says, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength, this is the first commandment. You know, when we think about this love that we have towards God, it, it really is this love that should help us worship God the way that God wants us to worship. So it's with all your heart. It's with everything that you've got. So you're worshiping God because you truly desire to worship Him the way that He, he wants us to worship Him. Now, the second, second component of true worship is in truth. So what is truth? Well, we know that, that truth really just means that it's founded upon sound principles. It is according to, to what God wants us to. Jesus talking again, John 17, verse 17 says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So we know that God's word is truth. It is what we have as our guiding principles and what, what directs our worship for God today. So if you're looking at true worship, it's both in the spirit with your whole heart, with everything you've got, meaning you truly mean it. Um, and it's through God's Word, it's, it's truth. It is uh, according to the regulations and guidance that He set forth in His Word. So that's true worship, and that's what we have today. So for a little while, I want to look at a couple different examples that we have, some examples that we have in the Old Testament and New Testament, and what we can learn from them. You know, sometimes when you're working with people, you're studying with them in the Scriptures, um, I've, I've heard it said, and I, some of you may have as well, that we really don't need to pay attention too much to the Old Testament because we're not bound by the old law anymore. Now, while it is true we're not bound by the old law anymore, the Old Testament is there for us, and it's there for our learning. If you look over in Romans chapter 15, verse 4, it says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. So even though we're not bound by the old law anymore, 
there's still a lot of things, a lot of principles that we can learn from Old Testament examples. So it's absolutely important that we read them, that we study them, and we see what we can apply to our lives and what we're required to do today as Christians. So I want to look at a couple of those examples um, in the concept of worship. So the first example we're going to look at is the story of Cain and Abel. Now, if you remember Cain and Abel, they were the first two humans born on, on earth from Adam and Eve. So Adam and Eve was created by God. They had two sons, Cain and Abel. So Cain and Abel, we have a story of them, and that's going to pick up in Genesis chapter 4, verse 1 through 5. So Genesis chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, it says, And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again, again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. So this is the story of Cain and Abel that we have, that both of them gave an offering or they gave a sacrifice or a form of worship to God. Both of them gave worship to God, and one of them, their offer was accepted, and that was Abel. Abel's offering was accepted of God, and Cain's offering was not accepted of God. So we can clearly see just from this very first example we're looking at, there is such a thing as unaccepted worship. So there is a way that you can worship God, and He will reject it, just as we talk about here. He rejected Cain's worship. So let's look at that a little bit, and let's try to figure out why. Why was Cain's offering rejected and Abel's offering was accepted? Well, if we look over in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 4, it says, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it being dead yet speaketh. So here the writer of Hebrews tells us that the difference between Cain's offering and Abel's offering is Abel offered it with faith. Now think about that word faith for a minute. When you look at the word faith, a lot of times we think of, well, that means to believe. Well, surely Cain believed in God as well. If you think about that, this is, is one of the first humans born, that his parents were Adam and Eve. Obviously, he would believe in God. And another way we know that he believed in God was because he offered a sacrifice to him. Why would you offer a sacrifice to something you don't believe in? It doesn't make any sense. So obviously we know that both Cain and Abel believed in God, but we also know faith is more than just belief. Faith is also obedience of what God sets him forth for us to do. So that was really the difference maker, is Abel offered it with faith, so belief and obedience, and Cain did not. So Cain had belief without the obedience. We can see that faith, where faith comes from, in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, it says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So we know that if we want to increase our faith, we increase our hearing, we increase our knowledge in the Word of God. So Abel offered a sacrifice that was according to what God's instruction was, and Cain did not. So Cain's offering was rejected, and Abel's offering was accepted. So one of the things we need to look at is when we're talking about um, that true worship is in spirit and in truth, well, Cain did not do that. Cain didn't have true worship in spirit and truth, but Abel did. So his was accepted. The next example that we have is the Levitical priest. So I want to pause just for a second. I want to talk about the tabernacle. When you look at the Levitical priest, so what you have through history, this would have been uh, after Moses led the people out of Egypt and he goes up to Mount Sinai. He gets a whole lot of instructions of what they should do. That's where the Ten Commandments come from. And then you have a lot more instructions. So all this is, is written out in Exodus chapter 25 through 40. So we won't read those 15 chapters this morning. But I encourage you to look through that. So Exodus 25 through 40 gives a lot of detailed <clears throat> instruction. And then also the book of Leviticus um, is a lot of instructions for the Levitical priesthood of what they're supposed to do and how they're supposed to give proper worship. It's very detailed instruction. So this is a, a diagram of the tabernacle that we have. So what you have is you can see the outer courtyard where the altar of the sacrifice is, the bronze basin. You see that's the outer courtyard. Now, the Levitical priests could come in here, and they could come into the holy place, and they could offer sacrifices unto God. 
So what they would do is on the altar of sacrifice, there was supposed to be a fire going there that never went out. So the fire was going 24-7, and part of the Levitical priesthood job was to keep that fire going. So they would have that, and then you have this bronze basin. That was basically a, a huge bowl of water that they would come in, they would wash themselves, they would clean up before they entered into the holy place. So they were supposed to be cleansed before they went in. You had the table of showbread, you had the lamp stem in there, and then you had the altar of incense. One of the instructions that they had to do was that they would take fire from the altar of sacrifice, they would take that fire, and they would go in and they would uh, light the incense, but it had to be from that fire. It was very specific instructions. And then once a year, the high priest, and there's only one of them at a time, and the only high priest could go back into the holy of holy places. <clears throat> so that was a big curtain that separated the holy place from the holy of holy. It was a big curtain. And the high priest would go back there once a year behind the, that curtain in the Holy of Holies where you had the Ark of the Covenant. And there's a few very symbolic things inside the Ark of the Covenant. And then on top of that, you had a couple of cherubims, which was angelic-like figures that would be there. And on, in those cherubims was what's called the mercy seat. And that's where it said, that's where God resided, was on that mercy seat inside the cherubims. So what the high priest would do is he would go back once a year and he would offer a blood sacrifice on the mercy seat to delay God's wrath against the sin of the people. And they would have to do that year over year over year. Um, so that is just a basic concept of the tabernacle itself. And there's a whole lot more very detailed instructions of how they were supposed to move the thing, how they were supposed to set it up, the different sides. You can see... Uh, at the top there, the north side, so it's supposed to be facing a certain way at all times. So there's a whole lot of very detailed instructions. So now we're going to pick up with a couple men named Nadab and Abihu. So Nadab and Abihu were the sons of Aaron. And if you remember Aaron, he was the first high priest. So the first one that God had set in. So And then his sons, Nadab and Abihu, were also going to be priests of the Levitical priesthood. So they were called to go serve and to do these certain things like, like light the incense and make sure that the things were taken care of. So we're going to pick up the story there with Nadab and Abihu. And that's in Leviticus chapter 10, verse 1 and 2. So Leviticus 10, chapter, one, or chapter 10, verse 1 says, And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And they went out, and there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. So, you know, we can look at this and we can see just these couple of verses that, well, at first, Nadab and Abihu, they were kind of doing what God told them to do. They were going to take a fire and they were going to light the incense. Remember that you had this altar of incense here in the tabernacle. Nadab and Abihu, they were doing part of their job and just go, and they were going to light that as a sacrifice unto God. But look at that at the end of verse 1. It says, but they offered a strange fire. When you look up that word strange, it really means an unauthorized. So they, un they offered an unauthorized fire before God. So if you remember, part of the instructions was the altar of sacrifice over there in the outer courtyard was supposed to have a fire running 24-7 and never went out. That's the fire that was supposed to be used to the altar of incense. I don't know what fire Nadab and Abihu did use, but it wasn't that one. It was a strange fire. Now, we look at it as humans, and we say, fire is fire. What's it matter what the source comes from? It's fire. It's still going to light the incense. It's still going to offer a sacrifice. But it's apparent to us that God looks at that differently. God looks at it of he has commanded them to use that fire from the altar of incense, not just any fire. So God had wrath upon them. So verse 2, it says, And there went out a fire from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Now we can look at this as pretty harsh, or we can look at this as, and that's just rough. Nadab and Abihu, they just were doing their job. And they, okay, they got one little detail wrong. But God looks at that as that's a very important detail. So their worship that was sent up to God was rejected. And Nadab and Abihu had to pay the price for that. So we can learn from these examples that we can learn that whatever God puts into practice, it cuts off everything else. So if God says do this, that means you do that and only that, and, and you do that the way that he wants us to do.
and Nadab and Abihu apparently did not follow after that way. Now the third example that we have is going to come from the New Testament. So the third example, this is Jesus talking here in the book of Matthew chapter 15. And we'll read verse 3 through 9. So it says, But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth father and mother, let him die, to die the death. But ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, It is a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honoreth not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Ye hypocrites, will did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, These people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. So what you have here is Jesus is rebuking these, these people here, and he's saying that you made God's commandment, what God set in motion, you made it of none effect meaning you made it, made it worthless because you're teaching your commandments as, or you're teaching your traditions um, as commandments. So things that you say are more important, you're not following after God's commandments and you're teaching people to follow after that way. And then Jesus tells us there in verse 8 that they draw nigh to me with their mouth. It sounds good. What they say sounds like they really want to worship God and follow after Him, but that worship is in vain. So what does that word vain mean? If you look up the Strong's Concordance, vain means to no purpose. So you're doing something that doesn't have any purpose. It also means that it's empty, it's unprofitable, and it's fruitless. So if you think about that vain worship that they're offering, it may sound good to human ears, but it's not acceptable to God. And if it's not acceptable to God, what's the point? Why are we doing something as worship to God if He's just going to reject it? So that's what these people were doing. They weren't really following after the commandments of God, and they were teaching the, the traditions that they were doing as more important, and God rejects it. So they may look good to other people, but they're not looking good to God. So we have to be careful when we're looking at the, these different things. Remember that true worship is in both spirit, with your whole heart, and in truth, according as how God set it forth. So how do we apply this today? How do we look at these different examples and as Christians make sure that our worship is true worship? You know, one of the differences we, we look at, uh, James Ludicky has a fantastic lesson over worship. And one of the things he talks about, and it's always stuck with me, is the difference between worship and entertainment. And, and from what he said in his lesson, and I think it's a very great, great way to say it, is worship is doing for God the things that pleases God. And entertainment is doing for us the things that pleases us. So we have to look at, are we doing things for worship, things to please God and the way that He set forth, or are we doing things for entertainment, things that please us? So, you know, there's a, there's a lot of different organizations out in the world today that call themselves churches, and they have church on the side of the building, that they're, quite frankly, just not following after the New Testament scriptures that we have. Those would be things of entertainment. They're doing things that please them because they want to do those. That's not worship. If it's not acceptable to God, it's not worship. Because worship is doing for God the things that please God. So we have to look at that. And we've got to make sure that we are doing, following the ways after the New Testament, things that are going to be pleasing to God. Another thing that we have to be careful of is we are a relatively conservative organization or group of people compared to other organizations out there. We're pretty conservative. So one thing that we have to be careful of is making sure we're not being so conservative or so to the book that we forget the entire purpose of it anyways. So sometimes we've seen groups that they'll get so much in the truth and all the little details and kind of nitpicking that they forget the in the spirit part that they forget that it's got to be with your whole heart. So remember, true worship has to have both elements. It absolutely has to be according to truth. It absolutely has to be following after the things that God set forth. And it absolutely has to be done with the right intentions, and your heart has to be in it. So we got to look at both. So for a little while, I want to look at true worship today and how we can do things that are pleasing to God and what He wants us to do and the great thing we know about it is if you're doing it with your whole heart, 
it can be pleasing to you too. It's okay to do something pleasing to God and please yourself. So doing the things that are pleasing to God, that would also be edifying and build us up as well. So when we're called and when we come to the assembly, we want to look at so that we're specifically talking about in the assembly here. Um, so when we assemble, what needs to happen? What are the things that we are supposed to do in, in when we come to the assembly together? Well, the first thing is we're singing. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19, it says, Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. You know, this, Bible, this, this passage teaches us to offer musical worship to God and that we should do that. You know, it tells us there at the end of the verse, it says, Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. When you look up that word, making melody, it means like to pluck strings. And if you think about like a guitar or like a piano, you pluck strings to make a musical sound. And this gives us a very good example of what's the instrument that we're authorized to use in our singing service. And that instrument's your heart. So you sing and you make melody in your heart to the Lord. That's the instrument that we have been called to use. There's other organizations out there that they use uh, musical instruments uh, with their song service, but the only instrument that we've been authorized to use is our heart. So as we're singing service to, to God. Remember that if we use an unauthorized uh, instrument, that it's going to be rejected. Just as Nadab and Abihu used an unauthorized fire when they went out before the Lord, it was rejected worship. So this is one of those things that we got to be clear with. Why we have a cappella singing or we only use our voice is because that's the only instrument that we've been authorized to use. If we look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, it says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. This passage also teaches us to sing, but it goes on a little bit deeper. So when we're teaching or when we're singing, there's a purpose behind that. And the purpose is that we teach and admonish one another. So one thing of how we can look at it today as Christians, when you're singing, pay attention to what you're singing. Look at the words. Understand the words. It can teach you and it should teach you and it should admonish you. It should build you up. It should encourage you. So when we're singing, we sing with our hearts. And that's the instrument that we use. And we sing with the purpose of giving praise to God and also for teaching and admonishing us that are singing together. The next thing that we do when we come to assemble together is prayer. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 15 through 17, it says, What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. Else when thou shalt bless with the Spirit... How shall he that occupieth the room of, of the unlearned say amen at the giving of thanks, seeing he understandeth not what thou sayest? For thou verily givest thanks well, but the other is not edified. You know, there's a lot in these three verses here that really give us instruction of what prayer should look like. So if you're leading a prayer, if you're saying a prayer in, in the assembly, there's a couple things that you need to pay attention to. You need to pray with the Spirit. Once again, Spirit means your heart needs to be in it. And you also need to pray with the understanding. When you're looking at that word understanding, you can see them there in verse 17. It says, For thou givest things well, but the other is not edified. If you're leading prayers, the other people in the room need to be understanding what you're saying as well. They need to be understanding the prayer that, that you're leading also. You know, I remember growing up, I would hear certain men give some prayers, and man, they just sounded great. They were just really eloquent. They used these big fancy words that just sounded awesome. And as, as a young guy growing up, I didn't have a clue what they were saying, but it sounded really good. Now, when I started leading prayers, I wanted to sound like that because it sounded good. So I would start repeating these words that the other guys were saying. I still didn't know what they meant, but it sounded really good, so I just said it. That is a very good example of not praying with the understanding. I didn't even understand what I was really saying. And the other people in the audience didn't understand what they were saying as well. Part of prayer is to edify those people around you as well. So when you're praying, you pray with the Spirit, your heart is in it, and you pray with the understanding that you know what you're praying and you know why you're doing it. <clears throat> the next thing that we have in the assembly is teaching. So in teaching, we have in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, it really gives us a lot of instructions and, and a lot of things of how the assembly is supposed to be played out. So we're going to read 1 Corinthians 14, 
verse 26 through 40. So beginning in verse 26, it says, How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation? Let all things be done unto edifying. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most by three, and that by course, and let one interpret. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church, and let him speak to himself and to God. Let the prophet speak two or three, and let the other judge. If anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. For ye may all prophesy one by one, that all may learn, and all may be comforted. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak. But they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. What? Came the word of God out from you? Or came it unto you only? If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy, and forbid not to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. There's a lot of instructions that we're going we're gonna to kind of dive into this one a little bit and look at a few things. One of the things that we looked at in, in verse 26 through 40 is how the teaching should be. There's a couple of different references that it shows we should have a multiple uh, men speaking, that we should have some sort of rotation. At the very end, it says all things be done in order. So we should be speaking one at a time. We're not causing a lot of confusion or disruption, but we should have multiple sp people speaking. So it says the prophets, let them speak one at a time and let there be course. There's a couple things that it mentions in here, and it talks about tongues. And I want to make sure everybody understands, when you look up that word tongues, all that really means is languages. So there are some other beliefs out there that tongues is just uh, this miraculous gift that some people have, and it's really a lot of babbling, and then that somebody is supposed to interpret that, those babblings um, into some miraculous prophecy. Uh, and that's quite frankly just not true. So tongues, all it is is just languages. So when you hear that, Let's go back and look at it. So when you hear uh, in 27, it says, If any man speak in an unknown tongue, if any man speak in an unknown language, let it be by two or, about, or at the most by three, and that by course, and let one interpret. That would be like if we brought someone in and they could only speak Spanish. If they brought in and they could speak Spanish and they start preaching in Spanish, I'm not going to understand hardly anything they say. I might get one word out of every 50 and it's not going to be much. So if you think about that, how is that really going to edify people if most of the congregation can't understand Spanish? Well, it's not. It's not really going to edify them. It may be great for the speaker, and he may have some really amazing thoughts that he's bringing out from the scriptures, but it's not really doing a whole lot of good to the audience because it's not edifying them. So the instructions that we have is it's totally fine to bring someone else in with an unknown language to speak to us as long as there is an interpreter. So as long as we can interpret what he's saying from Spanish to English and we can understand that, then we can do that. So it's okay to, to speak in an unknown, unknown language. A couple other things it talks about is, so we should have plurality of speech, speakers. We should have multiple, not just on one man. Um, we should make sure that, that there is an interpretation if it's in an unknown language. It also talks about how the women should keep silent. So we know from the scriptures that it's only the men that are supposed to speak. And I know this can cause a lot of disruption. There's a lot of people who disagree with that, but I didn't write these words. They're just in there. And it's evident to me that Paul may have faced the same things when he was writing these as well. If you look at it down a little bit after he talks about that the women are to keep silence, look in verse 36. After he tells that you know, it's a shame for women to speak in the church, then he says, what? Came the, word out of you, came the word of God out from you, or came it unto you only? And then he goes on and says, Let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are commandments of the Lord. So Paul is further backing up. is like, you may disagree that women should keep silence in the church, but it's the commandments of God. 
So that's why only the men are permitted to speak in the congregation when we assemble together. And remember, we're only talking about when we assemble together. It is, it is really fine and it's actually encouraged for women to teach outside the assembly. If you look in the book of Titus, it talks about let the older women teach the younger women. So there is definitely a time and place that women should be teaching. They should be speaking, just not when we assemble together for the purpose of worshiping God. So there's a lot of uh, regulations. There's a lot of guidance of how we know that our worship is going to be acceptable to God in 1 Corinthians 14. And we're just pulling out a, a few different points. You know, there's many religions that completely ignore these, these regulations, but this is how the Lord set it up. And remember that this is the Lord's church. It's not our church. It's the Lord's church, and it's His authority to, to set it up as how, how He sees fit. The next thing we're going to look at of something we do when we come together in the assembly is communion. Acts chapter 20, verse 7, it says that upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. So the example we have here in Acts chapter 20, it says that upon the first day of the week, the first day of the week is Sunday. So Sunday is the first day of the week when we come together for the purpose of breaking bread. There's a lot of different uh, religious organizations that they uh, don't do it every week. And, you know, when you look at this verse, it doesn't say on the first day of the week every week. However, the question that, that just comes to mind, it says on the first day of the week. Well, which week? Which week were you supposed to do it? There's some organizations that uh, they'll take communion once a year. And it's typically, it's usually tied to around Easter time that they'll do uh, communion once a year. Some will do it once a quarter. Some will do it once a month. Some will do it twice a year. Uh, they kind of come up with their own routine. But we see here in Acts chapter 20, verse 7, it says, upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread. So if you look at that, upon the first day of the week, to me, the safe zone is that's every week. So upon the first day of the week, it's every week that we come together to break bread. So that's what we do for the communion service. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 gives us a little bit more detailed instruction of what that's supposed to look like. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 23 says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament of my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he comes. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and of the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself. And so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. So there's a lot of instructions when we talk about the communion service that Paul was writing to the church at Corinth, and it instructs us as well today of how we're supposed to take of this communion. So first we have the bread, which represents God's body that was given for us. And then we have the fruit of the vine, which represents the blood that was given for us. We're supposed to take of the bread, and we're supposed to take of the fruit of the vine. We're also supposed to bless each one before we take it. So it says there in verse 24, it says, And when he had given thanks, he break it and said, Take, eat, this is my body. So when you're leading the communion service, you're supposed to make sure the bread is blessed before it's passed out so that the audience can take it. Same thing with the fruit of the vine. When you take the fruit of the vine, it says he blessed the cup before they took of it. So we have to make sure we, we take in a way that is pleasing unto him. We also are making sure the purpose of this is to remember him. Remember the Lord's death until he comes. So when we're taking of the, the communion, we bless it, and then we take it, and we think about the sacrifice that was made. And it talks about, in verse 27, it says, Whosoever eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily. And I want to make sure it's very clear that word unworthily doesn't mean that you are personally worthy or not worthy to take of the bread and take of the fruit of the vine, because let's be real, none of us are worthy of it. None of us are worthy of that sacrifice that God has made for us. None of us are worthy to continue to take upon it and that it washes our sins away. 
So that word unworthily means in an unworthily manner, that you're not doing it the way that God wants you to do it. Then it further gives us more instructions. But it says in verse 28, so to do it in an unworthily manner means that you're not examining yourself. When you look at verse 27 and 28, let's read that again. 27, it says, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink of this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But, when you look at that word but, that means you're changing. You're going in the different direction. So he just talked about you're eating of this bread and drinking of this cup unworthily. So you're doing it in a way that's not pleasing to God. But, so if you want to do it in a way that is pleasing to God, let a man examine himself. And so let him eat of that bread and drink of the cup. So Paul is telling us if we want to do it in a worthy manner, that you examine yourself. So this is a time that's very important. When you're taking of the communion, you're examining yourself. You're thinking about your own life. You're thinking about your walk as a Christian. You're thinking about maybe sins in your life that you need to repent of and things that you need to turn away from. You're thinking about the work that you do for the kingdom and how you should be working for God and doing the things that He wants you. You examine your own life. And that's not the only thing that you examine. Let's continue in verse 29. 29 says, For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Something else that should be on your mind during the communion service is you're thinking about the sacrifice that was made for you. You're thinking about what are we really doing here? that we're remembering God's sacrifice, we're remembering that Jesus came down and gave His life on the cross for our sins, that the bread represents that body that was given for us. Let's think about that body. That the blood represents, or the, the fruit of the vine represents the blood that washes away our sins. Let's think about that blood. Let's think about that sacrifice. So during the communion service, a lot happens than just taking a little piece of cracker and eating in a little cup of juice. It's an important service. You're examining yourself, you're thinking about the sacrifice that was made for you, and you're truly doing it the way that God wants you to. And we remember that we're doing this until the Lord returns. So it's on the first day of the week. We take of the fruit of the vine, we take of the bread, we examine ourselves, we think about God's sacrifice for us, and we do it till He returns. So that is about the communion service and why we do it the way that we do it. The next thing that we're looking at is contribution. In contribution, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1 and 2, it says, Now concerning the collection of the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God has prospered him, that there will be no gatherings when I come. So Paul's writing to the church at Corinth here, and he's given them the instruction upon the first day of the week to lay by a contribution, to lay by some money and things that you've been prospered with so that other people can be benefited from it if they need it. You know, it's interesting, we just talked about the communion, and in Acts chapter 20, in the communion, it says, and upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, and sometimes that can be interpreted on once a year, twice a year, once a quarter, whatever, all these different things. Looking at this in the contribution, in verse 2, it says, and upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store. It's interesting to me that a lot of the religious organizations that don't do the communion every week, they absolutely still take a collection every week. And they will use this example as, or they use this verse as their example to follow. And the verse is upon the first day of the week. If you look over in Acts chapter 20, verse 7, it's the exact same phrase upon the first day of the week when they came to break bread. So it's just interesting to me that we see that it's upon the first day of the week we're supposed to lay by in him, uh, lay by in store as God has prospered him. Now one thing too that's different in the New Testament versus the Old Testament, or specifically the, the Mosaical Law, is in the Old Testament they would do what's called tithing. And tithing means they give one-tenth of what they had, or 10%. So that's what they were required to give, and it was basically a fixed amount that whether they liked it or not, this is what God required of them. The New Testament's different. In the New Testament, we don't have a, a set amount that you're supposed to get. It doesn't matter how much God has blessed you with or how much uh, wealth you have or how little you have. The amount doesn't matter. But it says there that we're supposed to give as God has prospered us. So as God blesses you, then He expects that you will 
uh, give some back to the kingdom so that other people will have enough or they'll have things if, if they're in a down moment. Um, so we're supposed to give as God has prospered. That's not a fixed amount. And we're also supposed to give generously. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6, it says, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he that soweth bountifully shall also reap bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. So this is just another example of what we should be doing and how we should give. It's not grudgingly, but we should be giving cheerfully. We should desire to give to be able to help out. Uh, and it is no fixed amount when, when you give. So these are just a few of the things that we follow. When you look at uh, the New Testament church, the church that Christ has instilled, and specifically the worship service and the assembly of the regulations or the guidelines that we should follow for the purpose of making sure that our worship is accepted to Him. So we want our worship to be acceptable. So when we think about true worship in the assembly, we should all desire to be true worshipers for God. And that's worshiping in spirit and in truth. We should all want that as Christians. We should all want that our worship is accepted. We want to make sure the things that we're doing is not in vain, but they truly have a purpose. And the purpose is so that it would be pleasing to God. As individuals, as Christians in this congregation, we should all hold the congregation accountable to make sure that we're worshiping the way God wants us to worship. It's said a lot, and I'm going to say it again, don't take my word for it. When I'm up here speaking, I'm teaching you something, don't take my word for it. Test it. Be like the Bereans it talks about in Acts. Make sure that you receive the word with all readiness of mind, that you listen, you pay attention, but then you test it against the scriptures and make sure whatever is being taught is true. Make sure whatever practices are done in this congregation are true. Make sure that the things we do are true worship and that it will be acceptable to God. And that's a responsibility for all of us. Everyone in, in this building has the responsibility to make sure the things that we're doing is going to be true worship to God. And we can rest assured that when we're doing that, that our worship is going to be acceptable. It's going to be pleasing to Him. It's going to be edifying to us and all the, your fellow Christians around you, and that they'll be built up, that they'll be stronger Christians because of it. The kingdom will grow. There's so many different benefits that we know when true worship is happening in the assembly. And this is the true worship that we're called out to do. When we think about all the things that God has done for us, we think about, for one, He created us. Every good thing, every blessing that we have comes from God. All the different things He gives for us, to the point that He even gave His only Son to live among us and give His life on the cross for our sins, to clean up our mistakes, to help clean up our mess so that we can have and restore that relationship with Him. We think about all these things that God has done for us. It's a really small ask for us to just worship the way that He wants us to worship Him. And I think that's the least we can do as Christians. It's just do the things to God that are pleasing to God. And have true worship in spirit and in truth. So as we, as we close this service, I want to think about these going forward. And I hope you all can see the importance of true worship in the assembly. And hopefully that we will all will do the best we can to make sure we are being those true worshipers that we're worshiping in spirit and in truth. And if there's any among here uh, this morning that are struggling with anything, if you need the prayers of the church, you need encouragement, you need lifting up, then that's what we're here for. We're here to help you out as your brothers and sisters in Christ. If there's any who haven't started their walk with Christ and you still have sin in your life that you haven't been forgiven of, through, through baptism and you want to use that blood that we talked about this morning to wash away those sins, then we can help you with that too. So if there's some who would like to start their walk with Christ or if you need the prayers of the church for any reason, I ask you to come and have a seat on the front pew while we stand and sing the song that's been selected. We hope you enjoyed this teaching from God's Word. If there's anything we can do to help you in your walk with Christ, send us a message at facebook.com slash cfcnwa. To find more sermons, look for us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and like our Facebook page. Thanks for listening, and God bless.